uh, good evening. Could you turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. people. Oh, here they come. Let's go, chop, chop. All right. Let's take that moment of silent prayer. Should we have, first of all, be at first to me, uh, first Timothy chapter one, verse 18, not verse 12. First Timothy chapter one, verse 18. So without further ado, let's take that moment of silent prayer. Remember, we have our, our prayer meeting at the end of uh, service here this evening. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us to experience fellowship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, and with each other. We thank you, Father, for all the wonderful blessings that you've given to us that are related to our marriage to your Son, Jesus Christ, our union and identification with him. Father, we thank you for delivering us from all of our enemies. We thank you, Father, for delivering us from physical death and spiritual death, as well as our sins and the sin nature and Satan and his cosmic system, as well as eternal condemnation, Father. We, we're truly thankful that uh, you've treated us according to your grace policy, treating us better than we deserve. In fact, giving us unmerited blessings, blessings that we don't merit and that we're only receiving because we're directly related to your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for sending your son into the world to become a human being and to experience the human condition except without sin. We thank you, Father, for his great sacrifice at the cross and teaching us about that sacrifice, teaching about what he endured at the cross and what he accomplished for us at the cross and redeeming us out of the slave market of sin and reconciling us to yourself and also satisfying your holiness, demands of your holiness, which demanded that our sins and us be judged. So we thank you for the fact that he's went in our place, your son went in our place. And we also thank you for the fact that through the Spirit, you now look at us as you look at your son, crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with you, uh, seated with him at your right hand. And now, Father, we have a victory, victory over sin and Satan, and help us to appropriate by faith. Help us to grow in love toward you and each other, and that uh, you would continue to give us an experiential knowledge of your will. And, Father, we thank you for the Thompsons opening up their home, and everyone that's here not only in the Thompson household, but also those who are listening on Pal Talk will be viewing this class at a later date on the website or on the uh, the, DB, uh, the MP3s. We thank you for the, the privilege that you've given us to be a part of a gospel ministry, a doctrinal ministry. We pray that you would continue to break down barriers, not only for this ministry, but other ministries throughout this country and the world. Continue to break down the barriers Satan has put up that is hindering people from being exposed to the gospel for their salvation and also the gospel as related to their spiritual growth as believers. And Father, help us all this evening to concentrate those in the audience. Help them to understand what will be taught here this evening. Help them all to concentrate and help them to follow what the Spirit is saying and to apply it accurately of that which they are going to learn this evening, that they would take these things outside of these four walls and use them in their families, their businesses, their jobs, their relationships with people. And we just pray, Father, that it would be a great blessing to them, this class. We also pray that you would uh, empower the communicator to deliver to your people, communicate to your people with accuracy, your word, and with power. And we just pray that help him as well to be sensitive to the guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit. We pray that as a result of this Bible class, not only that the body of Christ would be built up and edified, but you and your son, Jesus Christ, would be glorified and would be praised. So in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, we pray for these things. Amen. 
This evening, we're going to study, you should be at 1st uh, Timothy 1.18 to start off with, just to repeat that. 1st Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. I say that because in the notes I have verse 12. But I want to start you at verse 18 of 1st Timothy chapter 1, which begins the final paragraph of chapter 1. Now, we're going to study verse 19, as I said before. And in this verse, Paul says that Timothy is to continue possessing faith, resulting in, which results in a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck of their faith. So we're going to have a lot to do uh, to study uh, this evening about faith. We're going to have a lot to say about that. And, and Timothy is going to be, uh, uh, Paul wants Timothy to uh, operate in that faith that we're to have after our conversion. Uh, most people understand that faith is related to getting saved, receiving the forgiveness of our sins and uh, being entered into the family of God, being declared justified, but also we need to walk by faith. And remember what Paul said in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, uh, verse six he said, as the same way that you receive Jesus Christ, which is by grace through faith, so also walk in him. So we need to, after, after we've been converted, after we've become members of the family of God, after we become children of God, we need to walk by faith. Now what we're going to see as well, and we touched on this last evening at the end of class, is that Timothy is involved in spiritual combat as it's related to false doctrine. Remember, he is dealing with a situation in Ephesus where he's being told by Paul to rebuke and tell these pastors in Ephesus to stop teaching false doctrine, stop emphasizing the law, and start concentrating on what they should have been doing, which is communicating the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation. So thus their congregations can grow up to spiritual maturity. Emphasizing the law will destroy that. So, now, so we see that he's in a spiritual uh, warfare, and uh, remember Satan is behind false false doctrine, and false doctrine has throughout the centuries uh, infiltrated and infected the church. So here we have uh, Paul telling Timothy to engage, be engaged in spiritual combat, which is related to combating false doctrine. Now we're going to see that uh, faith here this evening is related to spiritual combat. We're going to touch on a passage in Ephesians 6.16 where Paul talks about taking up the shield of faith. Last evening we touched on Ephesians 6.17 where we take, we're to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema of God, not logos, the rhema of God, which is a special doctrinal word from God to, to deal with a particular situation. And we saw last evening that Paul reminded, uh, in, this, in this epistle, he was reminding Timothy of the prophecies that were made about him, not in relation to receiving the gift of past the teacher or becoming a great friend of the Apostle Paul, or a great delegate, but rather the prophecies were related to this particular situation in Ephesus. Thus, that was the rhema from God. He got it from some prophets. And remember, these prophets were around in the pre canon period of the church age. Because the canon of Scripture is closed, we don't use it. God doesn't use those uh, particular gifts anymore. So they're discontinued. So we see that Timothy is being reminded of that word that he received through these prophets, that he was uh, going to be uh, involved in this warfare in, uh, in, uh, in Ephesus. And uh, so Paul wanted to give him encouragement by reminding him of these prophecies. So he, Timothy has got to walk not only by faith in what his, Paul's gospel is, but also in faith in what those prophecies had to say. And so Timothy, by doing so, would be able to uh, continue to fight the noble fight of doctrine, the noble combat, and which is superior to combat in the natural realm. Uh, many times we think of uh, the bravery, and we rightly so, of the soldiers that are involved in fighting in the, in the natural realm. How much more are those who are involved in spiritual combat with an invisible enemy, which is superior to the enemies that uh, uh, soldiers in the, in the natural realm face. So that, and the stakes are much higher. The souls of men are at stake. Uh, people die when in war, but in spiritual combat, people can die and then go to the lake of fire, which is worse. So we see this is a tremendous situation that's being uh, dealt with by Paul, uh, Timothy here. Paul's using Timoth uh, Timothy to deal with a very tickly, a ticklish situation, a very difficult situation. So Paul's going to tell Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.19 to continue possessing faith, which will result in a good conscience. So we're going to talk a little bit more about a good conscience as it relates to faith in the Word of God. And he's going to point out to Timothy uh, that some have actually rejected uh, this particular uh, uh, faith and have rejected uh, the, the, the Word of God and have rejected a good conscience. And, they, and as a result, they've suffered shipwreck 
of their faith. They've suffered spiritual disaster, and now they're under divine discipline. And Alexander and Hymenaeus are brought out as two individuals who were under discipline. Paul kicked them out of the fellowship of the church because they refused to stop teaching false doctrine. So look at 1 Timothy 1.18. It says, this command, and remember what we said last evening, it's referring to the commands that Paul gave Timothy in verses 3 through 5. That's what it's referring to. So he's basically, this command to, uh, to tell these pastors in Ephesus to stop teaching false doctrine and to uh, administrate the household of God, which is by their faithfulness, do what they're supposed to do. That command he's referring to. So this command I entrust to you, Timothy, the one in verses 3 through 5, my son, in accord these are in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you. So there were prophecies made about this situation in Ephesus. So the command that Paul issues in verses 3 through 5 is directly related to these prophecies that were made about Timothy prior to this situation, prior to Paul writing this epistle. And he, then he goes on to say the purpose. He states the purpose that by them, these prophecies, which is directly related to this combat, spiritual combat in Ephesus, you might fight the good fight. The word good there, as we left off last evening, means noble. It's kalos. And it talks about something that's superior. It's a tremendous, noble task. He could, the word means he couldn't do anything more important in life. And then he goes on to say in verse 19, he says, By keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've, I handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. If I could, let me read you my translation of those verses. It states, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my spiritual child, in accordance with the prophecies previously spoken about you, in order that, by means of them, you may continue to make it your habit of being engaged in spiritual combat, which is a noble combat, by continuing to make it a habit of possessing faith, resulting in a conscience that is divine good in quality and character, which certain individuals, because they themselves have rejected, have suffered shipwreck with regards to their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and, as well as Alexander, whom I handed over to Satan in order that they will not be in order that they will be disciplined not to blaspheme. So, verse uh, 19, let's look at that verse. It says, keeping faith. We have there, first of all, the participle form of the verb, eho, which is translated here, keeping. And then with it as its object, we have the word for faith, which is pistis. Now, this word refers to Timothy's post-conversion faith. He's already saved. He's already in the family of God. He's talking about a faith that is uh, something that takes place after his conversion. All of us have to walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. The, the, the Abraham, he walked by faith throughout his life. And that's the example we're to follow. Faith in the promises of God. Paul is telling Timothy to walk by faith in the promises of God. The promises, the prophecies were obviously had to re, uh, be related to the fact that Timothy would be successful because God would be with him. So this word faith, pistis, it speaks of Timothy exercising absolute confidence in the word of God in order to experience victory in spiritual combat. How do you know, how do you know that you're walking by faith? Do you obey what God tells you to do? Because faith in God's word is actually manifested, manifests itself through obedience. Somebody who is disobedient to God's word has no faith in God's word. It's impossible to be uh, disobedient and, and, and have faith. It's impossible to be un, uh, un, operating in unbelief and then obey God. They go hand in hand. Also, you can't love like uh, Christ does unless you're operating by faith in what the Spirit says in the word of God. So love and, and, and obedience flow from one's faith. Because remember, it says in Hebrews 11, 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, how do, you, how do you please God? With obedience. But you can't be obedient if you're not having faith in what the Word of God has to say. So it not only is faith an exercise of our volition, but it's also, it's also an attitude that we have toward God. We have an attitude that He is able to do 
uh, the things that we request without even seeing them, we believe that they will come to pass. That's why when we pray, once we know what the will of God is into a, in a particular area, we're to pray expecting, fully expecting, that we're going to receive what we requested. And of course, you always have to determine what the will of God is first. So this word, peace, these faith, does not refer to the objective body of truth, the content of the Christian faith, meaning Bible doctrine, although that is the object of the Christian's faith after conversion. Rather here, it's referring to the Christian soldier's faith or total and absolute confidence in God's faithfulness to his promises. So whatever prophecies were made about Timothy, that he would be, uh, would be successful, Timothy had to operate in faith in those promises, not to mention everything else that was in God's word. Now, in Timothy's case, it is faith in the prophecies that were told to Timothy that were from God. Since we're dealing with spiritual combat here uh, with Timothy, this word faith speaks of taking up the shield of faith, which is mentioned by Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. So hold your place. We were there last evening. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Interesting, because 1 Timothy was written to the Ephesians, though he doesn't name them explicitly. And here we are going to an epistle where they should have been picking this epistle up and reading what he had to say in, a, in, the, in this letter, which was actually a circular letter that was uh, uh, distributed throughout the churches of Asia. Look at Ephesians 6, 10. We're going to emphasize verse 16 because he mentions the shield of faith in that verse, which is exactly what Paul's telling Timothy to do in 1 Timothy 1.19. So he says in Ephesians 6.10, 6, uh, Finally, be strong in the Lord. The word in the Lord is by way of metonymy. Yeah, it's, it's in there. Why well, are you getting some of that? Okay. So it says, finally, be strong in the Lord. That's talking about strong in his word, the word of the Lord, and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. That's a metaphor, because he's talking about spiritual combat, a, a, a metaphor for the, the Christian's union and identification with Christ. Uh, we know that because the word put on there in the Greek, it's used in other passages by Paul of putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, which obviously is speaking of appropriating by faith your union and identification with Jesus Christ. So he says, put on the full armor of God. Why? So that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not against human beings, but against, that's why we should never consider uh, 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 our fellow Christians uh, as uh, the true enemy, and, or anybody, a human being for that matter, unsaved person, it's actually Satan. He's behind the problems that we have. For our struggle is not, and sin is too, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, human beings, but against two. Now, he, he mentions the, I, the angelic hierarchy. Satan has a, uh, a, a levels of, of, of authority. And here it is. He says, against the rulers, against the world, uh, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. They, they're, at, they're in the atmosphere of the earth. Uh, remember that. Because uh, remember in Genesis we studied, when it came time to do the atmosphere, he doesn't say, and it was good. He doesn't say that. Why? It's the only day he doesn't say that. Because that day, the second day, when he did the atmosphere, that was the day when the kingdom of darkness would inhabit that atmosphere. So he didn't call it good. That's why. Check that out sometime. So, they, so he says in verse 13, Therefore, take, and that's also in Ephesians 2, 2, he's called the prince of the power of the air, the atmosphere. So you wonder why your meteor is, is always ungodly? Think about it. Therefore, verse 13, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore. And this is all defensive posture. This is not offensive yet. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Remember, he was a chain to a Roman soldier, a Roman Praetorian guardsman. And they were the, the elite force in the Roman military. Uh, they worked directly under Caesar. They, they could be equated to special forces or see, uh, secret service, something like that. And they were individuals, their uniform, he was taking this analogy, he was taking the Roman guardsman, Praetorian guardsman uh, 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 armor, and he was trying to make spiritual application here. 
uh, with the different aspects of our relationship with Jesus Christ. So the, tr- the, the, the belt, remember he says, he says, having girded your loins with truth, that means the, that refers to the belt of the Roman Praetorian Guardsman. And he's equating that belt to truth. And that belt of the Roman soldier held the entire armor together. So truth, in the sound, in a sense, holds everything together for the Christian. And then he says, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, that means operating in the righteousness that God gave to you at the moment you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, Savior at, at the moment of justification. And then having, verse 15, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Notice that the gospel is related to the Christian's walk with God after his conversion. And actually, he's talking about combat boots. And the gospel gives you that firm footing as you go fight in spiritual combat. Then we have verse 16. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith. That's what he's asking, Tim. Paul's asking Timothy to do in 1 Timothy 1.19. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And I've thought about this many times uh, and I've even got more out of it. The, the flaming arrows of the evil one are many uh, are basically thought projections. And in particular, they're in false doctrine. Uh, the, the, you, it's, it's the gossip. It's the judging. It's the maligning. It's the... You, it's, it's the things that go on in our everyday lives, and that's all inspired by the kingdom of darkness and, of course, a, a result of operating in one's sin nature. So false doctrine is a flaming missile. Uh, for instance, you, uh, the, the false doctrine that you could lose your salvation. Well, that's, that's a flaming missile from the kingdom of darkness to get you to be upset and to get you worried about your salvation. God wants you to know if you have trusted in His Son, Jesus Christ, you've done what His Word says, you're accepted. And you have the Spirit. And the Spirit will tell you and remind you that you're His child. So also, the, the, the sin, when we commit certain sins, because the, the enemy loves to jump in there and condemn us. Because once they can get us guilt-ridden, then we can't move forward. Guilt is a sin. Christ, when you confess your sin... That's, you should never, ever be sitting there feeling guilty because that's an insult to the Father and the Son. Because if you confessed your sin, a sin that Christ died for, then what are you feeling guilty about? You're not operating in faith in the Word of God. See, Satan would love to whisper, it whispers in our ear, he has demon officers all around us, and they love to sit there and project thoughts at us to try, they can't indwell a Christian. But they can project dots at us, those flaming missiles of the evil one. So having faith, like for instance, uh, when you commit a sin, and it might be shocking to you, but remember, God's not shocked by any of our, any of our sins. He saw them before we were even created. But the enemy wants us to jump down our throat and say, oh, you did that? You can never be forgiven for that. You can never be forgiven for that. That's the way they operate. That is thought projected. That's false doctrine. There's no sin that you commit ever could commit that could, God could never forgive. And we just saw that with Paul. He could forgive any sin. So here we have those flaming missiles that were to deflect with the shield of faith. So our faith is like a Roman Praetorian Guardsman's shield. And it's also interesting. When, when, Roman, when the Roman soldiers went into battle, they would lock shields to protect each other. And that's how the church is supposed to operate. So once a church starts going and, uh, and splitting apart, there goes that protection that you could have if you stuck together and put all of you, all of us, put up the shield of faith. So he is Paul. He's remind, he's, he wants Timothy to put up that shield of faith. Now look at verse seventeen. He says, "And take up the helmet of salvation." And then he says, "The sword of the spirit, which is what the word of God." And the word of God there is not the word, word for, the word for word is not. Logos, but actually Rima. And that's what Paul's talking to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 18 and 19 about that special prophet, those prophecies related to his particular situation. That is called a Rima. And that is the sword of the Spirit. So the God's word to us is a sword. And the word for sword there is Machaira. And that word, uh, the Roman soldier, they were superior in combat. But they would do, they had double-edged swords, okay? It was a short dagger-like sword. Now the Germans, 
the Gauls, you know, other warriors in the ancient world, they would have a sword that cut on one side, and it was usually, it was the Romphia, and it was very big. And the problem with that in combat with the Romans is they didn't have a chance against the Romans. Because once they lifted their sword to take one shot at the Roman soldier, he could take his dagger-like two-edged sword and get to do 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 he could get you, just like Muhammad Ali doing a, a, a triple jab right at uh, Joe Frazier's head, or you know, that fast, and the guy is down. And so that, or like me with uh, Tyler Thompson, triple jab, boom, he's down, I got him out, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, he's out. So that is where, this is what we need to use, because no one can stand against the Word of God, people. It's more powerful than any nuclear weapon. Because it created everything and it can destroy everything. So God wants us to use his promises and claim them for ourselves. He wants us to apply and appropriate by faith our position in Christ. Because the sin, uh, the, then we can experience that victory over sin and say, this is what Paul is asking Timothy to do. He's asking Timothy to put up that shield of faith in 1 Timothy 1.19. So hop right back to 1 Timothy 1.18, please. 1 Timothy 1.18. So Paul writes in 1 Timothy 1.18, this command, the, what he said in verses 3 through 5, uh, verse, uh, yeah, verses 3 through 5, and he says, I, I command, this uh, command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, and these command, this command I gave to you, in verses 3 through 5, is in accordance with the prophecies of previously made concerning you, prophecies that concern the situation that Paul has Timothy dealing with in Ephesus, that by them, here's the purpose, that by them you fight the good fight, the noble fight, spiritual combat, and, keep, and then it says, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. So when he says keeping faith, that again is Timothy operating in faith in the word of God after his conversion. It's a post-conversion faith in the Word of God. Now, the failure to exercise faith in Paul's apostolic teaching, his gospel, which was sound doctrine, was the problem with these pastors at Ephesus who wanted to be teachers of the law. This led to their poor conduct, people. This led to their poor conduct because unbelief produces ungodly conduct, whereas godly conduct is directly related to faith in the Word of God perfect example, case in point, is this, is the Exodus generation. God was angry with them. He disciplined them because they were operating in unbelief. They would not enter that Sabbath rest because they would not have faith in him. And they demonstrated their, uh, their lack of faith in him by complaining, by fighting, backbiting, and attacking Moses' authority. They tried to kill Moses. They, considered, they thought Moses was trying to kill them. So they have a rejection of authority that was a result of their unbelief. So here we have unbelief is directly related to poor conduct. Faith is actually related to good conduct. Why? Because when you obey the word of God, it's a manifestation, expression of your faith in God. When you love the body of Christ as Christ loves, that's an expression of your faith. Because both faith, uh, faith, both love and obedience are directly flowing from your faith in the word of God. So faith is extremely important. You, can, uh, you can't, you can't, uh, please God without faith. And we see that in Hebrews. In fact, I want you to hold your place, uh, and we're going to take a hop over to a couple of passages that talk about faith, because this is the faith that Paul wants Timothy to operate in. And what is faith? So go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hold your place. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith, still getting there. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Remember I told you, faith is an attitude where you what you've asked for, you, you, you go on in life knowing and are assured of the fact that you're going to get what you receive. There's no doubt involved. You're confident. For by it, faith, 
the men of old gain approval. When he goes on in the whole chapter to talk about these Old Testament saints, the Old Testament Hall of Fame of Faith. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, because no one was there at the creation. So that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Now, Alexander and Hymenaeus, the people that Paul mentions that suffered the shipwreck of their faith, and he's talking Christians, those individuals were not pleasing to God. And it's impossible to please God without faith. Here's an example of people who operated in unbelief. It's in the same book. A, a group that operated in unbelief, and their conduct and their character was terrible because of it. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 3. Look at verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, he's speaking to believers. There's no reference to unbelievers here. The Exodus generation were all believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul explicitly says that. They all drank from the same spiritual rock. They were identified, baptized with Moses. They drank from the same spiritual rock, which is Christ. So they're all believers. They put blood on the doorposts and lintel, an expression of their faith. However, after they, were, they believed in Christ and were saved, they didn't walk in faith. Only jo Joshua and Caleb and their families and Moses actually walked by faith. Moses didn't go into the promised land because of his misrepresenting God's character and nature and uh, get, letting his emotions and anger get the both best of him. Look at verse 12, Hebrews 3.12. Uh, Take care, brethren, that they're, remember he's talking to them, brethren, they're Christians. They're not unsaved. Therefore, take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil and unbelieving heart. A Christian can have an evil and unbelieving heart right there. Why would he even say that to these Christians if that wasn't the case? He's trying to prevent them from having an evil and unbelieving heart. That's why he's saying this. So he says, take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil and unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Alexander and Hymenaeus and others who sh suffered shipwreck of their faith that Paul mentions in 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20, are those individuals who had an evil and unbelieving heart and fell away from the living God. Didn't lose their salvation. They just were under discipline, and many died the sin unto death, which he mentions later. Verse 13, But encourage one another, day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. He's speaking about that when he says partakers of Christ, he's talking about reigning with Christ. Look what he goes on to say. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Who? Israel, the Exodus generation. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom? Was he angry for 40 years? They were under discipline for 40 years. Then it says, Was it not with those who sinned, whose body, with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness, dying discipline? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter the promised land because of unbelief. Look at verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. No chapter break in the original. Therefore, let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to come short. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, the Exodus generation, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard didn't profit them, it didn't help their conduct, didn't, it, it didn't uh, transform their character because they didn't have faith in what the gospel said. 
Verse 3. But we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said, As I swore my wrath, they will not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, And God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this passage, They shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news, preach them, fail to enter because of disobedience. He again fixes a day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as he has been said, as he has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So there we have faith is very critical. When you can't please God without faith, if you don't operate in faith, then there's only one other, you're operating in unbelief. And when you do that, you're going to find yourself under discipline. Exodus generation learned that. Alexander and Hymenaeus learned that. And others who he doesn't name in 1 Timothy 1.19, who he says they suffered shipwreck of their faith. A disaster. The Exodus generation is a perfect example, example of that disaster. Now you can go back to 1 Timothy uh, 1.19, please. So he says in 1 Timothy 1.19, keeping faith and a good conscience, Timothy. He wants Timothy to keep faith, keep having exercising faith in the word of God, and uh, which results in a good conscience, as we'll see. So the word there, uh, keeping, it's the word echo, as we saw before. It means to be, it means, to, when it says keeping, it actually is referring to being in a particular state or condition of possessing something. And it's a participle of beans, indicating that Paul is saying that Timothy is to engage the enemy in spiritual combat by having faith in the word of God. So take up that shield of faith is what he's saying. Now the words in the present tense, it's a customary present, which indicates that Timothy is to, is to continue making it his habit of possessing faith in the word of God. Present tense means this should be his lifestyle. He should be characterized by this. It means it implies that he was already doing this. He's saying continue to fight with the shield of faith, to continue to operate in faith in the word of God. And then we have the phrase, in a good conscience. That's the preposition. The word and there is the word uh, ke. Uh, then it should actually, you'll see, it should be translated resulting in. And then its object is the word uh, uh, and that word is modified by the adjective agathos, translated good. Now these three words, if you might recall, appear in 1 Timothy 1.5. Now here in verse 19, the word and, translated and here, ka, is used in a consecutive sense. That means it's indicating that possessing a good conscience is the direct result of possessing faith in the word of God. And that's indicated, and that the Christian's norms and standards, which reside in the conscience, must be in accordance with the Word of God. Remember I told you, when people say, uh, uh, let your conscience be your guide. Yeah, that's a true, that's good advice, if your conscience, where the norms and standards of your life reside, are based upon the Word of God. So there's a lot of people whose conscience is seared. They rejected the Word of God. They have ungodly norms and standards, which we see all over the place today. And what we see here is that if we want our conscience to be a guide, it has to be based upon the teaching of the Word of God. So Paul's saying here that you want, he wants Timothy to have faith in the Word of God and those promises that were made to, about him, those prophecies, and that will result in him having a good conscience. Because when you have faith in God's Word, you're pleasing to him. And when you're pleasing to him, your conscience won't bother you. See, God, one of the great things that God did for us is he gave us not only the spirit, but also a conscience. And a conscience, uh, that's why I'm never really, uh, I'm never really too concerned about other Christians and what goes on. Because I know that they're all indwelt by the spirit and they got a conscience. And unless they got a seared conscience, they're going to be bugged by God if they do something wrong. Just like I'm going to be bugged by God if I'm doing something wrong. That's why we're to confess it and then do the right thing. But if you fail to confess it, your conscience is going to drive you crazy. And so uh, this is the, the conscience is a, is a blessing because it's what tells us what's right or wrong. It will condemn our actions, and then and also it will it'll uh, it'll be uh, it'll applaud our actions if they're good in accordance to, to our standards, and they'll uh, say that, and they'll condemn us if our if this if what we do or say is against our standards. So that's why it's important 
that we have the right standards, not the standards that we get from uh, the, uh, from, uh, the colleges and university and television and magazines, and godly magazine, but from the Word of God. So the more you know the Word of God, the, the better your conscience is going to be. And that's what we want. See, the, con- the soul has many different aspects. The conscience, uh, the, excuse me, the soul has many different aspects. First of all, we have a subconscious. A subconscious is that a place of the soul. It's like the garbage pan. It's all the things that shock us or uh, that are disturb us, they go right into that place. And one of the things you can really clean up your soul is with the Word of God. Operating and learning the Word of God, operating in faith in the Word of God, and a lot of the garbage that you've acquired can be flushed out. Okay? Now, there's also a mentality. That's where we circulate thought. That's where we rationalize. That was, and then there's volition. That's what makes our decisions. And then we have also, we also have uh, the emotions. And the emotions flow from what's in the mentality of the soul. So uh, then we have, lastly, we have the conscience. That's where our norms and standards reside. And so every, remember that conscience is what is these people here in Ephesus, these pastors, Alexander and Hymenaeus are, are the head of the list. They have a poor conscience. They have, have rejected a good conscience because they've rejected faith in the Word of God. Because of their rejection of Paul's teaching, because they were getting involved in false doctrine, they had a seared conscience. They had, and we're going to see here this evening, that their rejection was not, they weren't deceived. They knowingly, they knowingly knew it was right and rejected it. They knew it was right and they rejected it. So, good conscience here. That uh, the word uh, translated in is the word ka. It's used in a consecutive sense. That means it's presenting a result to us. And that's indicated in that the Christian's norms and standards, which reside in the conscience, must be in accordance with the word of God. Now, as was the case in 1 Timothy 1.5, this now, which is translated conscience, it's the word sine thesis, and that word in verse 19 means conscience. It's correctly translated. And again, the conscience speaks of that aspect of our souls where our norms and standards reside. And they're to be based upon the teaching of the Spirit and the Word of God. Let me give you an illustration I like to bring out from time to time about uh, not letting your conscience be your guide unless it's the Word of God. Uh, years ago, back in the 1800s, uh, 1900s, excuse me, uh, remember uh, England was a very powerful nation. Uh, the sun never set on the Union Jack. The Union Jack is the flag the Brits had. So we see that they used to, they had Pakistan and India at one time. They were colonies. Well, uh, the in that part of the world, uh, when a widow died, uh, excuse me, when a woman's husband died, she was put, they put her to death. They would actually, this is true, they do it even some places today. They would burn this particular woman alive because her husband died. Now, when the, the Brits saw this, for the, for the, 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 they were trying to do this, they stopped it, and they arrested these, this, the people who were going to do this, and they brought him to the commandant of the city. And they brought him in there, and the commandant says, what are you doing? And the man said, our conscience says that, because of our religion, it says that we should burn this widow. It's a part of our, our, what we do. And the commandant said, well, my conscience says that I should execute you because you're a murderer under my standards. But see, under that guy's standards, the, 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 the Indian, and I'm not talking American Indian, I'm talking the Indians on the other side of the world, those individuals who are practicing this particular religion, they had the wrong standards because their standards were not according to the Word of God. So the commandant was. He said that would be, that was murder in God's eyes because his word says that would be murder, putting this innocent woman to death just because her husband died. It's a true story. So there's a perfect case in point where you better have your norms and standards based upon the teaching of the word of God. I've heard so many times Christians say and do stupid things because they think, they say that God has let them. Yet what they do is totally against the word of God. How can you say that uh, what you're doing or saying is, again, is, is, is what God wants you to do if it's rejected in the Word of God. You can't, pu- what they're doing, what they're saying is, this, my emotions are governing me. It feels right. Well, let me give you a good example. It feels right to marry this particular woman or man. 
because they're so sweet and beautiful. He's got curly hair, and he's got a nice ring on, uh, he's got two rings, and he's got such a great smile, and I just love him. But he doesn't have doctrine. He doesn't care about the things of God, and so therefore, you're going to marry him anyways, even though the Word of God says not to do it. Because the Word of God says not to be unequally yoked. But he's so cute and so beautiful. And it could be vice versa as well. Well, you know what? That person, I feel, I feel God has led me. Yet what they're doing is against the Word of God. See, the lazy Christian says, it feels right. It, it, I feel that God is moving me. Yet what you're feeling is contrary to the Word of God. You're a whack job. You know how I say it? You're, you're a whack job. And I know, it, you know, I know what you're about because I'm a sinner too. Anytime we reject the Word of God, we're whacked. We're whacked out of our minds. So don't, you know, that's why it's so important to learn your Bible. But you know what's killing the, the Christians? Is they don't know their Bible. If I did a test in all the church, and, and I'd love to do a test in churches in Iowa, let's just take Iowa, I'd flunk, I'd flunk a whole bunch of them. They, even, they don't even, some of them don't even know the most basic things. They don't even know how to be filled with the Spirit. They don't even know what it is. They think it's an emotion. And they get worked up and they're running around and they get the, you know, like those guys on uh, TBN sometimes. You know, that's not the filling of the Spirit. The filling of the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit is based upon what's in your soul. The Word of God. And it will flow out in emotions many, many times. It will flow out though in right conduct correct conduct that's pleasing to God. And you know you and, and you can only love like Christ does if you have faith in what the Word of God says. Let me give you a good example. If we if we're bitter toward our fellow, uh, let's if we do something wrong against our fellow Christian or our fellow unbeliever, or the unbeliever, if we do something wrong against them and we uh, we gossip about them or we we we're bitter toward them or we're unforgiving toward them or we say mean things about them, we go back at them. It just mad. It's just a manifestation that you have not looked in, in, uh, looked back in faith in the Word of God as how God treated you. Because if you did, if you had faith that God loves you and forgave you when you were his enemy, you wouldn't treat your enemy or somebody who does something wrong to you the way you did. Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, that means you're going to operate in faith. But if you don't love your neighbor as yourself, treat them the way you'd want to be treated, it's a sign that you don't operate in faith in the Word of God. So conduct is directly related to our faith. And so our conscience, a conscience that's pleasing to God, a good conscience, a conscience that's divine in quality and character is a result of faith in the Word of God. So, again, when he says conscience, that's that aspect of the soul where our norms and standards reside. So Paul's telling Timothy that he's to engage the enemy in spiritual combat by continuing to make it his habit of possessing faith in the Word of God, which results in possessing a good conscience. Let me tell you something. We'll see this next week, uh, not tonight. But when you don't have a good conscience, when your conscience is racking you, it'll affect your physical body. It'll affect your physical body. It'll affect your face. You know, it's just a sign. That it's a manifestation you're under discipline. So if you want to get under discipline from God, don't operate in faith. And hey, here's a good one for kids. Okay? The Word of God says, obey your parents. Ephesians chapter 6, so you can live long in the land. If you reject that, you're caught. God, the Holy Spirit, will convict you, and you're going to have a bad conscience. And that's where you're going to walk around like this. And pouting comes from that. I know, because I used to be a kid, and I used to pout a lot, too. Too bad I didn't have anybody to give me the Word of God. So that's a sign of you walking in unbelief. Operating in faith will result in you obeying your parents, as God tells you to. Now, he says a good conscience. The word good, agathos, is modifying this word, synethesis, conscience, and it describes the conscience as good in what sense? In the sense that it's divine in quality and character. Why? Because it's in accordance with the will of the Father. Therefore, Paul is saying here in verse 19, that in order for Timothy to defeat the enemy in spiritual combat, he must continue making it his habit of possessing faith in the Word of God, resulting in a conscience that is good, in the sense that this conscience will be divine in quality and character. Because it's governed by the Spirit and the Word. It's good. The conscience is good in the sense that it's according to the will of the Father and the holy standards of God, which are revealed by the Spirit through the communication of the Word of God. Look at verse 19, 1 Timothy 1.19 again. Please. He 
says in 1 Timothy 1.19, keeping faith and a good conscience. And then he says, which some have rejected. Which some have rejected is a relative pronoun clause because we have the word os, which is translated correctly, which is a relative pronoun. Then we have the word for some. It's an indefinite pronoun. It's the word tis. That's correctly translated. And then we have the participle form of the verb apoleo. Apoleo means have rejected. Now, that's, this is a key word here because it's going to tell us about the attitude of these guys. These pastors who have suffered shipwreck of their faith and Alexander and Hymenaeus led the gang. Okay? Now, when he says uh, the, uh, the word there's some, that's the word tis, as I said before. It refers to certain unidentified Christian pastors in Ephesus who taught false doctrines in fulfillment of Paul's prophecy as recorded in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Uh, that's indicated. How do we know that? Well, it's indicated that Paul's contrasting the way Timothy is to conduct himself with how certain pastors in Ephesus, led by Hymenaeus and Alexander, conducted themselves according to Paul's doctrine. So what Paul's doing here in verses uh, 18, 19, and 20, he's, compare, he's contrasting Timothy with these pastors who are, who are unidentified, except for Alexander and Hymenaeus. He's contrasting their poor conduct and lack of faith with Timothy's faith and good conduct. So here we have a contrast being stated here. So the former Timothy will be victorious in spiritual combat if he continues to make it his habit of possessing faith in Paul's apostolic teaching, his gospel. While the latter, led by Alexander and Hymenaeus, remember they're Christian pastors, they're going to suffer defeat. Because the first way to, the, the, the way to spiritual defeat is unbelief. No faith in the word of God. And we can manifest it that way. We can, manifest, we, can, we can break this out. If you don't want to learn God's word, you're dead meat. You're going to be a casualty. You're going to have a miserable, miserable life. Because the Holy Spirit's going to be convicting you, and you're going to be under discipline. Confess the sin, and then not, just don't keep confessing. You confess the sin, but learn his word. Apply his word. See, a lot of Christians, they confess the sin, and they go turn right around and sin again. With a mental attitude, sin. A sin, an attitude, a, a thought can make you or break you. So you confess the sin and don't turn around and sin again. Confess it and do what God tells you to do. Okay? It's, you, you confess it. That takes faith to do that. And then after you, you're brought back into fellowship, stay in fellowship. How do you do that? Obey his word. But if you don't know his word and you don't care to learn about his word, that's unbelief. That's unbelief. You've rejected it out of hand. So you're going to be disciplined. See, some Christians think they're not going to get away with you. If God loves you. He loves you too much to let you do this. Do the same. And not me. Too much for us to do the stupid thing over and over again. He loves us too much. He's going to do something about it. I mean, it would be just like it would be just like uh, uh, Titus and Jody. If if uh, uh, Tootie and Fruity over here, Cheyenne and uh, Tyler were doing something bad. Now, they would be terrible parents if they were letting you do something bad all the time. Like if Tyler was always going up to his sister and going, bam! And the parents didn't do anything about it. If Tyler and Jody didn't do anything about it, they wouldn't love it. It would show that they didn't love Tyler and, and, and Cheyenne, right? Because why would you let your kid do something that's bad for them? Why would you let your kid come home drunk every night and not deal with him? Okay? But you, you, it was no, you don't love them if you don't deal with them. What do you think God does with us? He loves us too much to let us stay in our misery. Sin is misery. So he's going to do something about it. And so this letter is actually a manifestation. I brought this up at the beginning. It's a manifestation not only of Paul's love for the, these pastors in Ephesus, but also it's ultimately God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who want Paul to tell Timothy to do these things because they love those pastors in Ephesus. So when God disciplines us, it's because he loves us. And I always love when certain Christians go, well, that person's under discipline. And their attitude, discipline is, oh, God's getting you back. Like God is like this bad old guy that's just, you know, pounding you down. That means that they, those people are ignorant. That's being stupid. That's being ignorant of the word of God. If somebody said, God's disciplined, like, good, he loves me. He disciplines me all the time in different ways. He disciplines you too in different ways. He does us all because he cares about us. He loves us too much to let us be, to have sinful patterns of behavior and not deal with those things. He will deal with these things, okay? 
So when he says there, the word reject, uh, it says, uh, uh, which some have rejected, the word rejected is the word, as I said before, apoleo. And that word means to reject, and it's used with these unidentified pastors in Ephesus as its subject. Now, this word indicates a conscience, a conscious, excuse me, it reflects a conscious, deliberate rejection of the Word of God. It means that they were not ignorant of the Word of God. They knew it, and they said, uh uh-uh, I'm going to do what I feel. It means that it's a conscious, deliberate rejection of the Word of God, i.e., Paul's teaching and context as well as the holy norms and standards of of God's word, which is, you know, God wants us to have a good conscience. He wants these pastors to have a good conscience, but they don't because they've deliberately rejected the word of God. And it shouldn't be shocking to see a Christian reject the word of God. It happens all the time. It's in the Bible. We just read about that, the Exodus generation. Heck, they saw the miracles. They saw the ten plagues. They saw the part of the Red Sea. They saw a whole bunch of stuff that we never saw or anything like that. They did, and then, you know what they did? God doesn't care about us, and they complain and complain and complain. God says, said, I'm smacking these guys. I love them, and they're going to learn to not do this. But you know what? They didn't learn, and they died the sin to death. All of them died. And they walked around in a circle for 40 years. For 40 years, he just walked one of the, so if you're working around in a circle in your Christian life, maybe God's trying to tell you something. When you get out of the circle, then do what he tells you to do. That's what he wants you to do. Do what he tells you to do. So they, these guys in Ephesus, these pastors, they rejected the revelation of God's will and the word of God, and they rejected his holy standards, which are to be reflected in the, in, in the Christian standards, which are found in the conscience. So the word apoleo, expresses their antagonism to the gospel and God's standards. I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. Christians reject the word of God. You teach the thing over and over again, and they turn right around and reject it. How do you know that? Because of the way they say things and the way they act and the sin that they commit. What do you do? You pray for them. That's what you do. So they have an antagonism. This word saying these guys knew. They were ordained by Paul. And they said, we reject it. It's a deliberate, conscious rejection of the gospel, of the word of God. So this word is related to these pastors in Ephesus who Paul does not name, though he does name two in verse 20, Alexander and Hymenaeus. So this verb, avalel, indicates that this was not a passive rejection of the word of God, resulting in a rejection of his standards, but a deliberate act on their part. It makes clear that they're culpable and responsible for their own failure spiritually, and they're going to be held accountable. How do you know they're being held accountable? Because this epistle was written to them. They're being held accountable. One of the most dangerous things for any Christian and church and pastor to do is not be held not wanting to be held accountable. Not wanting to be held accountable is a bad, bad place. We all have to be accountable. We all are accountable. So this verb also makes clear that they were not deceived, as I said before. They were not deceived into teaching false doctrine. It was not an intellectual problem either, because they didn't, it, that, like they didn't understand. No, they understood Paul's teaching and, he, and, the, and, stand, and the standards that God had in, his te- in, in the Word of God, yet they rejected him out of hand. This term indicates, apoleo, it indicates that these pastors in Ephesus who sought to be teachers of the law did not want to be accountable to the Father, Son, or the Spirit. You know what, though? They are accountable. God's going to discipline, and then they, they're going to have to stand before Christ at the Bema seat. You're held accountable. I'm held accountable. No one gets away with anything. And because a certain sin has not been dealt with in your life by God, doesn't mean he ain't going to deal with it eventually. Okay? He, 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 you, you, we need to understand that God is holy. And he has per- holy standards, and he wants his kids to walk in his standards. And these guys in Ephesus, these pastors, probably the ones that Paul ordained, were saying, no, we reject it. We're going to go and follow the Judaizers. We're going to teach the law. The heck with the gospel. And there were reasons why they did that. Some of them loved money. They could make more money doing it than in the gospel. So these individuals, this term indicates that these pastors in Ephesus who sought to be teachers of the law did not want to be accountable to the Father, Son, or Spirit. 
They sought to live independently of God, which in essence is evil, which originated with Satan. Independence from God is manifested in evil, which is independence from God, is manifested by the rejection of his word. Remember, Satan, did he, what was the sin of Satan? Did he commit, did he, did he commit adultery? Did he commit fornication? Did he lie? What did he do? He, he rebelled against God. And you know what happened when he rebelled against God? He said, I will, I will, I will, I will. He wanted to live independently of God. He didn't want to be accountable to God. However, that he is accountable to God. In fact, we saw in the, in the book of Job, we saw that many times, that, 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 that God convenes a council. The angels, all of you know, fallen angels are held accountable. They have to come in when God says to. Where you've been going, Seth, Satan? Well, I've been running around the earth going here and there. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, God knows that. You're going to be held accountable to me. You're accountable to me, Satan. And the same thing with these pastors here. Everybody's accountable. So these pastors, though their conscience and, and the Spirit convicted them, though their conscience and, and the Spirit convicted them, they still rejected the gospel. Now this verb, apoleo, Rejected is a participle of cause. That means that because these pastors in Ephesus who sought to be teachers of the law rejected possessing faith in the word of God and possessing a good conscience, i.e. the holy standards of God, which are expressed in the word of God, because they, reje they, because they rejected possessing faith in the word of God and possessing a good conscience, they suffered shipwreck of their faith. That means a disaster. The middle voice of this verb is an intensive middle. It emphasizes their volitional responsibility for their failure. They're responsible for their failure and nobody else. One of the manifestations of, a sin, of the manifestations of the sin nature and that you're a very immature Christian and a person is that you blame everybody for the problems in your life. It's the husband's fault. It's the wife's fault. It's my pastor's fault. It's the deacon's fault. It's my girlfriend's fault. It's my boyfriend's fault. It's my teacher's fault. It's this person. Everybody's to blame except you. Everybody's to blame except you. That's a sign that you're an immature person. You know, it's time to take responsibility for our actions. When you screw up, go to God and say, hey, I confess it. When you hurt somebody, you mistreat them, don't be afraid to go and say, hey, I screwed up. I apologize. I shouldn't have said that. I was wrong to do that. See, a weak person, a little man, and a little woman can never say, I'm sorry. They always are in the right. And you see women talk about this with men, with men who got so much pride that they can never admit that they screwed up. And you see that with the ladies, it's vice versa as well. And that's pretty sad. You want a real man, he owns up to it. He, he, he makes a mistake. Everybody makes a mistake. Only Jesus never made any mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody. Now look at verse 19 again. We're coming near the end. He says, In keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected, and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. What a sad statement. Suffered shipwreck in regard to the faith is a prepositional phrase again. The word peri, translated in regard. Then we have the, the noun in the accusative form. It's articular. It's the word pistis. And then we have the verb, the verb which is nafayao. And that word means suffer shipwreck. Now, this verb here, nafayao, is used in a figurative sense in order to describe the spiritual disaster that has taken place in the souls of these pastors in Ephesus who sought to be teachers of the law. It speaks of a catastrophic damage to their fellowship with God as a result of rejecting Paul's teaching and adhering to the false teaching of the Judaizers. It was catastrophic because they were kicked out of the fellowship. The, the Alexander and Hymenaeus were kicked out of the fellowship of God. Some of them Got, uh, remove themselves from the fellowship with God, the, uh, the fellowship, the Christian, the church fellowship. They remove themselves. They'd rather live in sin than stay with God's people. That's how disastrous that is. That's a terrible, terrible place to be, where you would rather be with, a, with in living in your sin than in fellowship with God and, and serving and, and, and encouraging your fellow Christians. So this word, Navayao, suffered shipwreck, it speaks of the catastrophic damage to the, these pastors and their fellowship with God as a result of rejecting Paul's teaching and adhering to the false teaching of the Judaizers. Consequently, this rejection of Paul's teaching adversely affected their conscience, their norms and standards. Therefore, because these pastors in Ephesus rejected Paul's apostolic teaching, 
This rejection adversely affected their norms and standards, and thus their conduct in speech. Have you ever been sat there and go, I can't believe that Christian did that? At some point, you're going to see that. I can't believe they said that to that person. I can't believe they said that to me. I can't believe they did that. How could they do that? Well, you know what? They have a sin nature. And that volition gave into it. But the sadder thing is, everybody sins sporadically. Everybody who sins here and there. But the really sad cases are where people sin and they never confess it. They never get back in fellowship with God. They just rather live like hell. I'd rather be drunk all the time. They'd rather be fornicating all the time. They'd rather they, they get they have a lifestyle. See, that's what happened to King Solomon. King Solomon, if you read about the, uh, what God said about him at the end of his life, Solomon died the sin of the death. He let his foreign wives take him away from God. God was angry with him. He's still in heaven, but he lost rewards. David, who did some bad sins too, like Solomon. However, David didn't let his many wives take him away from the, the plan of God. He still was a man after God's own heart. In fact, it says that David did everything that God wanted him to do. And the only place he really, God points out he screwed up was with Bathsheba, in particular Uriah, because he killed Uriah just to protect himself. So here we have, here we have a sad situation where these guys are in a lifestyle of living in their sin nature. And that's a disastrous place to be because you end up under discipline. And also, what's disastrous about it as well is that it's miserable. It's miserable being out of fellowship with God. You can tell a person's out of fellowship with God by just the way they, their face is. I mean, I'm just saying they might have a bad day. I'm saying they, they, you could just see it in their face. I'll never forget this woman. She told me, a Christian woman, she said, her, uh, her um, son was, uh, was just a real, being a real, he was a Christian, being a real jerk. And uh, this woman's husband uh, was in the hospital, and she saw her son come in, and she just said, you know what, just looked at his face, and we just had this, and she said, you know what, Whatever, I won't say his name, you wouldn't know what I mean anyways, Billy Bob, I can say that, Billy Bob, you, you could see it on your face, you need to confess your sins to God. She said that to him. I just thought that was great. Because she sees him day after day, and he's just got a sour puss. He's miserable. It affects your countenance. When you have sickness and you're sick in the head because you're out of fellowship with God, you get ungodly thoughts and bitterness and anger. You know what? That's going to affect the way you look. When you're depressed all the time, hey, I get to a point. I used, I used to fall in depression. I, from time to time, will. But not like I used to when I was younger. It's miserable. I remember those days. I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to live, spend three days, four days in depression. It's a miserable place to be. It's like, ah. It was, it, you know, as soon as I get a little bit, I get, oh, I can't stand it. Cause, you know, some people, they like to sit in depression. And I'll feel bad for yourself all the time. Oh, woe is me. Oh, bad. How about spending, confess your sin and then start thanking God for everything you have. And you'll find out that you got it better than most people. Because there's always somebody who's got it worse than you. So this verb, as we close, Nafayao, shepherd shipwreck, it describes the disastrous consequences of this rejection and that it caused them to lose fellowship with God and stay out of fellowship with God, which results in divine discipline from God. The word faith there, suffered shipwreck of their faith, it's that word peace thesis again. It refers to these pastors in Ephesus it speaks of their post-conversion faith, just like it did of Timothy's faith earlier in the verse. Specifically, it speaks of their post-conversion faith, and, where, and, and of course, they were not operating in that faith. They did not have faith in the Word of God. They rejected the Word of God. So this is indicated by the, the fact that this is referring to the, these pastors. Post-conversion faith is indicated by the articulate construction of the word peace, which means it's referring to a word that appeared earlier in the verse, and that that word is that's appearing the second time is retaining the same meaning as it had earlier in the verse. So as we look at the verse, he says, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regards to their faith. Now he's going to see, and we're going to see in verse 20, uh, Tuesday we'll see it, is that now he's going to mention Alexander and Hymenaeus and the discipline that they're under. He, Paul, administered a church discipline. I had to do that one time. And I'll 
I'll tell you, that was one of the most miserable, that was a terrible time. I didn't really like doing that, but I had to do, and you know what? I had to do it, otherwise God would have to deal with me. And so I, so this is what Paul had to do. And I'm sure Paul, just like a parent doesn't like, you know, spanking their kids and, you know, disciplining their kids, I'm sure Paul didn't enjoy it, having to kick these two pastors out of the fellowship of the church. That was pretty cool. All right, let's close in prayer, and then we'll have our prayer meeting. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with the things that we've heard, guide us in the application, encourage us, rebuke us if necessary. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for the protection your word gives us. And we pray that this word would be mixed with faith, that we would operate in faith in what we've learned and apply it in our daily lives so that we could be obedient and operate in love toward you and each other and all men. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's take a couple of minutes and then we'll have our prayer meeting.